Hey guys, we are going to start today a brand new section called States of Matter. So go ahead and get those notes out, split your screen, and we're going to get started. So your ICANN statement today is I can identify states of matter. You guys have been talking about this probably since about third grade. We're going to talk about solids, liquids, gases, and we're going to add a fourth one called plasma. So split your screen and let's start taking notes. Um, at the very end, you're going to have a Google form that you need to fill out. So get ready and let's get going. Um, don't forget in Google Forms, you can use uh, read and write, ask any teacher about it, and they'll talk about it in their Zoom as well. So let's talk about those states matter. Solids, let's start with those guys. So if we take a look at solids, one thing or a couple different things that you need to know is that they have a definite shape and they have a definite volume. So if you look at a couple of the different things that I have here, I have a very solid ball, I have a definite um, solid marble, I've got my watch, um, and all of these guys have, there we go, sorry. These guys have definite shapes. Doesn't matter how I squeeze them, how I push them around, they are going to keep their shape and that's because they're completely 100% solid. If they're not 100% solid, they might actually squish or you know change their shape because they might have air or something in there. But if they're 100% solid, they're going to keep their definite shape. Volume is all about how much space they take up. And this takes up a certain amount of space and it doesn't matter where I place it, it always takes up this amount of space. Same with this marble, doesn't matter where I place it, it takes up amount, the same amount of volume no matter where I happen to place it. Place it in a cup, place it over here in a bowl, it's going to take up this amount of volume. It has a definite volume. Now one thing that is unique, and I know that's sort of behind there a little bit, I apologize. These particles in a solid are really closely packed together and they're really close packed together, but they're also vibrating constantly, but really close together. And all particles are doing that. So they're always constantly vibrating. Now, because they are solids, they have the lowest amount of kinetic energy, which means they're vibrating at the very lowest um, energy level of all the different states of matter. Um, and so we're going to take a look at that so you can actually see what that looks like. If we look and compare, this is a solid state of matter, has the lowest amount of energy, but they're all packed in together, but vibrating at a very low amount of energy. Okay, now we're going to change that up when we start looking at states. Of now liquids have an absolute or don't have an absolute definite shape. They do not have a definite or they do have a definite volume. So definite volume, but not a definite shape. So let's take a look at that. Okay, guys, uh, what we have here, again, they do not have a definite shape, but they do absolutely have a definite volume. So they take the shape of their container. So if we take a look at our liquid that we happen to have in a beaker right here, we can change and we can move these around to different containers, and they're going to take that shape. And you guys know that. You can move it around, and whatever happens to be uh, the container shape, it's going to take that shape of that container. But if we put it into a beaker and we take a look at the volume that we happen to have in this beaker, and I will tell you ahead of time, beakers are not the greatest at measuring. They're not actually used for measuring. Um, we have about 100 milliliters of liquid right there. Right there, about 100 milliliters of liquid. And it would be better if it was flat on the surface, um, flat on the ground, and uh, we were using something else, but I want to give you this as a demonstration. We have about 100 milliliters. If we move this around and we put it in here and we moved it into a different container over here and pour it in here and then finally pour it into our graduated cylinder right here. And then look at the measurement right here at the very end, 100 milliliters again. And I changed it into four different containers, but it stayed at right at 100 milliliters, no matter what, even changing it to those different containers each and every time because volume stays constant. And you guys already know this. You cook, you've done things at home, you've helped mom or dad, you've made brownies or cake, and when it calls for a cup of liquid of some sort to put into your baking, you can take a cup, you can put it in the measuring cup, and then you can dump it in and know that it's still one cup of whatever you're doing. So that volume stays constant. Now, why are unique, why are liquids a little bit different, right? Why do they take the shape of the container versus 
um, solids not being able to do that. The reason is their particles are a little bit further apart. And these particles whoop, that we see, and we get it right here, these particles are a little bit further apart. And, um, and I'll show you that here again here in just a second. They're sliding past each other. And the reason they're further apart is they've had more kinetic energy, just a little bit more kinetic energy than a solid. And so if we have that solid that's really close together, you add some kinetic energy or some heat, they're going to move a little faster. They're going to break apart and they're going to be able to move further and slide over each other. So if we take a look back at that picture that we had here, here was our solid. If we add a little heat, a little kinetic energy, we can see that they're still very close together, but just a little bit further apart. And now they're moving faster because of the kinetic energy and they're actually moving past each other. They can slide past each other and fill up their container as a result. So that's one thing that's a little bit different than solids that's unique to liquids. And then we get to our gases. So let's take a look at our gases. And what we find with gases is that they do not have a definite shape and they do not have a definite volume, which means that they are compressible. So let's take a look at those. Let me get those ready for you. Okay, guys. So what you see here is that we have, I have a container that's actually filled with carbon dioxide or, or uh, liquid nitrogen, not liquid nitrogen, sorry, dry ice. Let's try that again. And so I have filled that up and you can notice that the dry ice has actually sublimated is what it's called. And it's filled up this entire container. And what's nice about uh, dry ice is that you can actually see it. So we can actually see that it fills up that container. So it doesn't have a definite shape, just like liquids. And we can see that I actually have it here in the beaker as well. So it has filled up, this gas has actually filled up the container. And just like liquids, what's really unique is that they can actually, gases, which we don't actually see very often, but gases, just like liquids, actually flow. But the one thing that is only unique to gases is that they do not have a definite volume. They can compress. And so we can take like a balloon and we can sit here and we can actually compress those gases. Um, and that's unique to them. And that's because their particles are so far apart. You can take a syringe, has gas on the inside of it. Put your finger over the end and you can sit there and you can press, 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 and you are compressing those gases because the particles are so far apart. Let go and it pushes back out because it doesn't want to be squeezed together. Just like you, you don't want to be squeezed in a tight space. As soon as you can stretch out, you're going to stretch out. And that's what those gas particles are going to do too. You can press, compress, compress, and stretch out. And that's really cool because that gives us the ability to take like oxygen and squeeze it into a really small space like a canister and then people that need oxygen can walk around with gas in our oxygen canisters and be able to breathe with those because we can compress that oxygen to a really small space. Okay. And that's all due to the fact that those particles are really far apart and they can move in any direction. And the result is that they've had lots and lots of kinetic energy. They've had heat added to them. That means their particles are really far apart and then they can move in any direction. So let's take a look and see what those look like. So we've had our liquid here, add a little bit of heat, and what happens? It changes into a gas. And now they're moving much quicker because they've added heat, kinetic energy, and they're moving very, very far, or very, very quickly, but they're also very far apart, which means they can also be squeezed closer together. All right, so the fourth state of matter is what we get when we take a gas and we add lots of heat energy to it. So lots of heat energy in the form of heat to it, we can get this plasma, this fourth state of matter, the actual most common matter that we have in our, or state of matter that we have in our entire universe. And we can get it formed as a result of lightning. Um, we can get it as a result of auras. We can get it as electricity can actually provide the energy that's necessary in order to form plasma as well. Um, so we can get all this and we can form plasma as a result. And plasma is just the result of stripping off electrons and forming the gas or uh, taking off the electrons off the gas and forming these charged ions. And that's what plasma actually is. Okay. 
So we get these charged ions. And what happens when we have plasma is that it really reacts with electric fields and magnetic fields. And that's because it already has this electric charge. It's really, really cool. And because of the electric charge, one thing that's really unique to plasma, whoop, try that again, is that it actually is a really, really good conductor, which means it allows heat and electricity to flow through it. Okay, so one conductor that you might already be familiar with at home is like metal. Metal, we cook with it because it allows heat to go through it without melting, right? So it allows heat to go through it. That's a good conductor of heat. But we also use metal in our wiring in our house because it allows electricity to go through it. Well, plasma is a much better conductor of both heat and electricity. And um, if we could actually harness that in some way, it would be much do a much, much better job than our metals that we have here on Earth. Now, I told you already that almost it's the most prevalent state of matter, but we really didn't discover it till really late and late. And we'll, uh, we'll watch a video on that here in just a minute. 99% of all visible matter in the universe is actually made of plasma. And some of the plasma that you may or may not already know about is the fluorescent lights in the ceilings that we have here at school, or if you have them in your house, that's plasma. They actually have electricity going in one end, there's gas filled up in the tube, and it charges it. And as a result, we actually get this light, this plasma that we actually can see. We have neon signs that are just charged plasma, and then you've got plasma screens such as TVs and computer screens. Okay, and I've got something for you guys to see that you might be able to, that you might have at home. So here is a plasma ball, which you may or may not have seen. Maybe you have them at home. But again, it has gas in it. Electricity is going through it, and it's charging that gas on the inside, making it charged ions. And we end up with plasma as a result. So this is just sort of fun. We've got them here at school. And if you guys get to come back, you'll get to be, have the opportunity to play with it as well. And this is just charged plasma. And I should say it's just plasma. It's charged ions. But this is a result of charging the gas that's on the inside of this. So there you go, a plasma ball. Okay, there's a quick little video that I want to show you on plasma. Um, it's pretty awesome. I think you'll enjoy it. I don't know about you, but if I was on a ship and I saw a glowing sphere of light suddenly floating around the top of the mast, I would be... I think this is the proper term for it, freaked out. But for centuries, sailors saw that all the time. And they thought the mysterious blue glow was a good omen because they associated it with the end of a storm. They called it St. Elmo's Fire after St. Erasmus, the patron saint of sailors. But we now know that it's a natural phenomenon. When the pointed end of a ship's mast interacts with the heavily charged air, like during a storm, it can create a ball of plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter after solid, liquid, and gas. And even though it makes up 99% of the visible universe, we didn't know plasma was a thing until the late 19th century. In 1879, Sir William Crookes, a British chemist, first discovered that he could make what he called radiant matter using a glass container with two electrodes in it, which he used to ionize the gas inside. This matter was later called plasma by American chemist Irving Langmuir in 1928 because he decided that it looked like blood plasma. Plasma is like a gas, but instead of containing neutral atoms or molecules, it's made of ions and electrons. So to create plasma, all you have to do is create conditions in which electrons get knocked off the particles in a gas. Sometimes this happens because the gas is hot. The extra energy knocks electrons out of their places, ionizing the gas. Other times, a powerful electric current can eject electrons from gas particles, turning that gas into plasma. But even though plasma essentially comes from gas, it acquires so many special properties that it's considered an entirely different state of matter. Normally, for example, gas isn't all that good at conducting electricity. Actually, it's often used as an insulator. But in plasma, there are so many detached electrons floating around, it becomes incredibly conductive. This conductivity shows up in lightning, for example. When a powerful current forms between two highly charged areas in the atmosphere, it passes through a long, skinny column of air, heating it to five times the temperature of the surface of the sun. Lightning is actually a trail of plasma. And since electric fields and magnetic fields are both a result of the same force, electromagnetism, plasma also turns out to be very responsive to magnetic fields. Researchers often use this when they're trying to control the stuff to study it. But we also use plasma all the time in our everyday lives, like in fluorescent lights. When you turn on a fluorescent light, an electric current ionizes 
ionizes the gas in the bulb, usually argon with a little mercury, and it becomes plasma and interacts with a compound called phosphor to create light. So sure, you'll find plasma in all kinds of places on Earth, but in space, the stuff is everywhere. Stars, for example, are just giant balls of plasma. The tremendous heat generated by their fusion reactions has the same effect on atoms of gas as found in a Crookes tube or a fluorescent bulb, only much, much, much more so. And there's plasma between stars, too, even between galaxies. We normally think about the space between stars and galaxies as a vacuum, and a lot of it essentially is, but there are a lot of places that have quite a lot of matter. It's just spread out over light years of empty space. And that, too, is plasma, pockets of gas that have been superheated into clouds of ions and electrons. Cosmologists think that up to 50 percent of the normal matter in the universe is strewn around between galaxies in this form, known as the intergalactic medium. So you don't have to be an old-timey sailor to witness the fourth state of matter. It's right over your head in the fluorescent lights and outside your window the next time a thunderstorm comes, and, well, all over the universe. Thanks for watching this. All right, so as I've already stated, hopefully you enjoyed that plasma. I thought it was pretty interesting. But as I've stated before, when matter actually gains energy, those particles start vibrating much, much faster. We saw that when we saw the solids change into the liquids and then finally change into the gases. And then as they cool, they actually vibrate much slower as well. And so if you want to take a look, I've got this as well. So you can actually see that. Here we have room temperature particles. So this is just a gas in general. If we cool it off, so we take that temperature down, notice they're much, much slower moving. And if we heat it up, they start going crazy because they start moving much, much quicker. So add heat, they start vibrating much quicker and take the heat or the kinetic energy away and they're actually going to slow down. And if you take enough away, you can actually change states of matter. If you add enough, you're going to change states of matter as well. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the very last thing that you guys need to know about. And that is this little thing called absolute zero. Absolute zero is known as zero Kelvin. Now, this is something unique because there's no degrees in this. So we talk about Celsius. Celsius is zero degrees Celsius is where temperature or water freezes, zero degrees Celsius. It freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But Kelvin, we don't use that term degrees and we don't use the little circle or whatever. It's just zero Kelvin. Now, zero Kelvin is the absolute coldest temperature that absolutely exists. And this is where there's no longer any particles that move at all. And it's called zero Kelvin. Okay, and you can look at this temperature scale over here. Zero Kelvin is negative 273 degrees Celsius. It's negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's just zero Kelvin. And a lot of people like to, you know, joke that that looks like okay. And it does. It looks like the word okay. Um, but Kelvin's actually used quite a bit um, and something you should be familiar with. And people like to use Kelvin scale. You know, it has a thermometer as well. And they like to use this Kelvin scale because you'll notice there aren't any negative numbers. So when it comes to calculations, a lot of people like to use the Kelvin scale because there aren't any negative numbers. And so Kelvin's used quite a bit and it only goes down to zero. OK, um, Celsius and Fahrenheit, they both have negative numbers. So people don't like to use that as much with some of their different calculations. All right. So absolute zero coldest temperature that the pop possibly is no particles move anymore. So there's a couple memes that go around. Maybe it'll help you remember absolute zero. Um, here you go. A absolute zero might help if I could get my thing out of the way. My little thing will disappear already. It says you would still move me. No, that's not true because at absolute zero, nothing moves. And then also here, this guy is called Chemistry Cat. He has tons of little science things out there. And it said, did you hear about the guy who was frozen to absolute zero? He's okay now. <laughs> okay, zero Kelvin. Anyway, have an absolutely awesome day. Talk to you guys later. Hopefully you got your notes. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.